Hello, everybody. Welcome back. Um, we are moving on to chapter 10. Um, so this chapter is all about antimicrobial drugs, which we know as antibiotics. So we're going to talk a little bit about the history and the overview of how antibiotics work. And then the rest of the mini lessons are just going to focus on the different targets in bacteria um, that antibiotics work against that allow them to be um, successful. And then we'll also talk about the huge problem we're dealing with with antibiotic resistance. So that'll be kind of wrapping up our mini lessons at the end of the chapter. Um, before we get into the material, though, I have a little bit of an excerpt from a book called Where the Germs Are, a scientific safari, kind of a fun, light science um, nonfiction, if you want to do, if those exist. So here's how it goes. Here is how it goes. One day in 1921, an English bacteriologist happened to have a cold. So he added a bit of his own nasal mucus to a petri dish just to see what might be cultured of it. A few weeks later, he noticed that the bacteria growing in the dish, a harmless type of coccus, had failed to grow in the area near the mucus. Something in the mucus was dissolving and killing the bacteria. The bacteriologist called that something lysozyme. And over the ensuing years of intensive investigation of the substance, he found it in, you ready for the list? Tears, sweat, saliva, mucus lining the cheeks, fingernail clippings, hair, sperm, breast milk, leukocytes and phagocytes of the blood, fibrin that forms scabs over wounds, the slime of earthworms, the leaves and stalks of numerous plants, including buttercups, peonies, nettles, tulips, and turnips, and in very high concentration in egg whites. He had stumbled across the first natural anti-infective, an enzyme later given the chemical name mucopeptide glucohydrolase. We just call it lysozyme <laughs> still. Um, this scientist would, eight years later, accidentally find something else in one of his petri dishes, a substance that would change the life of almost everyone on the planet. Hmm, who do you think this is? The bacteriologist's name was Alexander Fleming, and he would name the new discovery penicillin. So I think that's a really good um, kind of jumping off point into our discussion of antibiotics. So I also have a little um, that I usually share in class. So it's Halloween. What are you supposed to be? I'm an unfinished course of antibiotics. I can lead to antibiotic resistance. Aren't I terrifying? And Beatrice was never invited to the Halloween party again. I like it. I would totally dress up as antibiotics. Um, unfinished antibiotics, of course, is way more scary. Um, so right, let's take a look at the history of antibiotics around Alexander Fleming's time and what was going on. So in the notes here, it talks about before the turn of the century, the last turn of the century, but like 1900s, there was no um, effective antimicrobial agents at all. Like they just had figured out, thanks to Coke and Pasteur and all those contemporaries, that germs actually cause disease. Um, but then what could they do about it? There really wasn't any treatment other than just supportive care um, for, trying to treat people with an infectious disease, with a bacteria or a virus. So Paul Ehrlich talked about him, um, father of chemotherapy, if you remember from chapter one. So he focused on his magic bullets, these chemicals that would target just the pathogen and leave the healthy cells alone. And so this is what we call selective toxicity. Um, we kind of, again, saw that back in chapter one. So that's a picture of the syphilis um, spirochete that he was working on. Um, and in that, Micro Hunter's book, if you choose to read that sometime and whenever you have free time, there's a whole chapter on Paul Ehrlich and his solutions. I want to think, I want to say it's like in the 600s, he numbered them based on the trials and failures, if you will. So it was like number 600 and something that was finally a success of treating syphilis without killing the patient as well, which is a a pretty big side effect for those um, early antimicrobials. Um, and then we had Alexander Fleming in 1929 discovered the penicillin. There's a picture of him there um, in his microbiology laboratory. There's a recreation. I don't know if this is an actual photograph of one of his plates. I'm guessing not. Um, <clears throat> but there is the bacteria kind of in the zigzag and then the fuzzy looking growth. That's the fungus, and then you can see the zone of inhibition. So you guys will be doing your Kirby Bauer in lab um, activity, and that is what he discovered is, hey, there's this contaminant, this fungus that he wasn't planning on growing, but he kind of made an observation that it was killing the bacteria. So anything that they could find that could kill bacteria might be worth taking a look into. So then they 
um, kind of studied any chemicals that were secreted. I think he won the Nobel Prize for that, pretty sure. Um, but even though uh, penicillin was the first antibiotic discovered, it really wasn't the first one that was widely used. It wasn't until the 40s that penicillin really became widely used in the public. Um, before that, we had this guy named Gerard Domac, and he came up with or discovered or identified sulfanilamide, which are the sulfa-based antibiotics. And we'll see some of those in our discussions later. Um, so in 1932, this really was the first widely used antibiotic um, on a wide spectrum of bacteria. <clears throat> Let's see. Um, and then we have Selman Waxman, um, who actually coined the term antibiotic. So it wasn't Fleming, he usually gets all the credit for antibiotics. Yes, he did identify penicillin, but it wasn't the first one, and he didn't call it an antibiotic. Um, this guy did that, and you can see he's um, looking at a petri dish without any gloves or goggles on, so that's, I guess, old school microbiology. Um, and then this picture of this micrograph here I'm showing you is a streptomyces. So this is one of those organisms we saw back in our little survey of bacteria in chapter 11. Um, that one of their notable contributions is they produce a lot of antibiotics. So this is Streptomyces. And if we take a look at the table uh, here in your, from your textbook, these are the major sources of antibiotics. And you'll notice there's a couple of fun fungus there, the penicillin, um, but most of them are bacteria. So bacteria make antibiotics, which is kind of an interesting concept, is why would they make something that's going to kill bacteria? Well, you can think of it as competition and trying to secrete something that might kill your co competition so then you can have all the nutrients or the environment to yourself. So here we can see quite a few organisms, um, quite a few bacteria are coming from the genus Streptomyces. We see a few bacillus here. We should be familiar with that, a couple pseudomonas. Um, but you can take a look at the drugs on the right-hand side, and the, some of them may be familiar to you. You may have even, have even taken some of them in your past, um, or family members may have seen vancomycin or penicillin or streptomycin or tetracycline, chloramphenicol. All of these are antimicrobial chemicals that are derived from bacteria. And then we as humans can manipulate them and make them semi-synthetic or synthetic versions of these antibiotics, okay? All right, and then lastly, um, we're gonna finish up kind of this intro mini lesson on kind of where we're heading in the other videos. So this is an all-in-one picture of the mechanisms of microbial action. These are six targets that antimi uh, antimicrobial drugs deal with. So we're going to spend some time taking a look at how antimicrobial drugs inhibit cell wall synthesis, um, how they inhibit protein synthesis, how they disrupt cytoplasmic membranes, how they interrupt and block metabolic pathways, how they interrupt and inhibit um, nucleic acid synthesis, and how they inhibit or interrupt a pathogen's ability to recognize or attach to the host. So all of those things are targets of all of these varieties of antimicrobial drugs. So if you can't grow a cell wall, you're not going to survive. If you can't make proteins, you're not going to survive. If you can't maintain your plasma membrane integrity, you're not going to survive. If you can't do your metabolic pathways, you're not going to survive. If you can't replicate your DNA to make more of your organisms, you're not going to survive. If you can't bind to your host cell, you're not going to be able to cause an infection. So all of those things these drugs are trying to target while at the same time leaving alone the host cells um, structures and functions. So we're targeting things that are different between prokaryotic cells or viruses and eukaryotic cells. Um, so as we wrap up, just a disclaimer for this chapter, I'm not going to have you memorize all of the drugs and their mechanisms of action. I'm more concerned with your ability to understand how these drugs block these targets, not attach a particular drug you know, so I'm not going to ask you what does tetracycline do, but if I were to say tetracyclines inhibit protein synthesis, what would that mean? Or what are some of the ways that protein synthesis is inhibited? Things of that caliber is kind of where my expectations are for those long lists of drugs in your in your textbook. You do not have to memorize those. Okay. All right. So let's we're going to move on to our next mini lesson um, with inhibition of cell wall synthesis. I'll see you in a bit. Bye.